Welcome to BC Storytime. I'm Ben. Today's tale unfolds in 1997 in South Korea, involving a case of indiscriminate murder. Indiscriminate murder, as the term suggests, is when the perpetrator and the victim have no personal conflict, a random act of killing. The trial process of this case was a tumultuous journey that spanned over two decades, capturing widespread attention in Korean society. The intrigue lies in the fact that two suspects were present at the crime scene, both accusing each other of being the murderer. It wasn't until 2017 that the Korean court finally reached a verdict on this case. This is the gripping tale of the infamous 81 murder. In the vibrant Yongsan district of Seoul, there's a well-known commercial area called 81. Its proximity to the U.S. Army's Yongsan garrison made 81 a favored destination for American soldiers since the 1950s. Over time, it evolved into Seoul's most exotic tourist spot, offering a vibrant mix of entertainment and leisure activities. Now, let's rewind to April 3, 1997, when a shocking murder unfolded here. What happened on that day, causing prolonged and widespread controversy in Korean society? Let's delve into the events of the last century. On April 3, 1997, a Thursday night, 22-year-old university student Cho Jung-pil and his girlfriend were taking a leisurely stroll in the 81 district. Cho Jung-pil, a student at Seoul Hongik University, hailed from an ordinary family. His father worked as a bus driver. Diligent and academically accomplished, Cho Jung-pil aimed to change his family's faith through education. Around 10 p.m., as he and his girlfriend were window shopping, Cho Jung-pil felt the need to use the restroom. Scanning the surroundings, he spotted a Burger King at the intersection, thinking there must be a restroom inside. He told his girlfriend to wait outside, assuring her that he'd be right back, and entered the Burger King alone. Inside the Burger King, about 20 young men and women were enjoying a party. Most of them were relatives of U.S. soldiers stationed in Korea, giving off the vibe of a group of troublemakers, with some engaging in drug use. Among them was Arthur Patterson, a 17-year-old American-Korean mixed-race individual, holding a folding military knife, a subject of discussion among the partygoers. Another person in the crowd was Edward Lee, an 18-year-old Korean-American. His father was a U.S. military personnel stationed in Korea. The party was in full swing when Patterson and Lee suddenly got up and headed to the restroom. They coincidentally followed 22-year-old university student Cho Jung-pil who was going to use the restroom. Note that Patterson and Lee had never met Cho Jung-pil and had no personal grievances with him. However, once inside the restroom, for reasons unknown, Patterson and Lee viciously attacked Cho Jung-pil from behind while he was relieving himself. Cho Jung-pil, caught off guard, collapsed in a pool of blood within seconds. Covered in blood, the perpetrators, realizing the gravity of their actions, hastily fled the restaurant. The first person to stumble upon the crime scene was a waiter at the restaurant. As he pushed open the restroom door, he was hit with a strong, nauseating smell of blood, and his eyes fell upon someone lying in a pool of it. The scene was horrific, enough to startle him into a hasty exit to call the police. South Korean law enforcement responded promptly to the distress call. Unfortunately, by the time they arrived, Cho Jung-pil had already succumbed to fatal blood loss. The continuous movement of restaurant staff in and out of the crime scene further compromised its integrity. Consequently, despite the police's efforts to investigate, the scene yielded limited valuable evidence. What they did ascertain was that two individuals were strongly suspected of involvement, but they had both managed to escape. Cho Jung-pil's girlfriend was present, allowing for immediate confirmation of the victim's identity. At that moment, she was too shocked to utter a single word. Forensic analysis revealed that Cho Jung-pil had sustained a total of nine stab wounds, three to the right side of the neck, four to the left side of the neck, and two to the chest. The fatal blow was a deep stab to the left side of the neck, causing a rupture of the major artery and resulting in death from excessive bleeding. Authentic crime scene photographs depicted a significant volume of blood, indicative of the assailant's brutal assault with nine merciless stabs, as if settling a blood feud. On the following day, South Korean authorities received an anonymous tip implicating Arthur Patterson as the perpetrator of the previous night's 81 murder. Consequently, Patterson was swiftly apprehended. 
During the investigation, it came to light that Patterson had an impulsive and violent demeanor, often carrying small knives. A search of Patterson's residence uncovered the folding military knife used in the crime and the clothes he had worn that night, yet to be discarded. While Patterson admitted to being in the restroom that night and owning the knife, he adamantly denied committing murder. On April 6, major South Korean television networks reported extensively on the Itaewon murder. Lee's father, a U.S. military member stationed in Korea, was conveniently in the United States at the time. Witnessing the news on television, he promptly returned to Korea. Faced with the realization that his son was likely implicated, he urged Lee to turn himself in to the police. Lee complied with his father's advice and presented himself at the South Korean police station. This marked the point where both suspects from the scene were in police custody. However, this was just the beginning of the South Korean police's incompetent and perplexing performance. Despite residing in Korea, both suspects were American citizens with limited proficiency in Korean. Lee, in particular, requested a translator, but for reasons unknown, the arrogant South Korean police rejected his plea. This hindered their communication to some extent, but it didn't escalate into a major issue. Soon, the South Korean police faced the daunting challenge. Patterson and Lee were mutually accusing each other of murdering Cho Jung-pil, each insisting that the other was the true culprit. The actual perpetrator had been cunning, selecting a restroom without surveillance cameras for the crime and involving another person, creating a convoluted scenario that made it challenging to definitively identify the assailant. According to Lee's account, Patterson instructed him to accompany him to the restroom. Lee, thinking he had just finished eating, decided to join him. Perhaps washing his hands in the restroom would be a good idea. Upon entering, Lee noticed someone urinating at the right urinal. Without much thought, he headed to the sink to wash his hands. Suddenly, he observed Patterson pulling out a small knife and stabbing the person from behind who was urinating. The shocking sight left Lee terrified. In Patterson's version, however, he pointed the finger at Lee as the true culprit. Patterson claimed that on that day, Lee told him to come and see something. Believing it was an invitation to do drugs, Patterson followed. Upon entering the restroom, he noticed someone urinating. Patterson decided to wait until the person left before indulging in drugs. Unexpectedly, Lee rushed over, snatched his knife, and stabbed the person urinating nine times from behind. The person offered no resistance and collapsed. The entire process lasted less than 10 seconds. Terrified by what he witnessed, Patterson fled. During Lee's statement to the police, he maintained that he went to wash his hands and never expected such a horrifying event. The police pressed him for details, such as the direction from which Patterson stabbed the victim and how many times. Lee claimed he was too frightened at the time and couldn't recall the specifics. In contrast to Lee, Patterson, during his statement, vividly described the entire incident, providing a clear account of the entire attack. After a series of investigations, the South Korean police believed Patterson was more likely the perpetrator, citing the following reasons. First, the folding military knife used in the crime belonged to Patterson. Second, after the crime, Patterson attempted to destroy evidence. Third, Patterson's entire body was stained with the victim's blood. Since the victim's major artery in the neck was pierced, blood pressure would have caused the blood to splatter extensively on the perpetrator. Although Edward Lee was also splattered with blood, the amount was much less. From this, it could be inferred that, at least in terms of proximity, Patterson was closer to the victim. Fourth, Patterson had a tattoo of the Norte 14 pattern, a symbol associated with gangs in California, USA. Therefore, the South Korean police considered Patterson more likely to be the culprit. When the South Korean police handed over the investigation results to the South Korean prosecutor's office for Patterson's prosecution, the prosecutor's office disagreed with the police's inference. Instead, they believed Lee was the murderer, based on two points. First, both suspects underwent 10 lie detector tests, all of which consistently showed Lee lying while Patterson did not. It's important to note that, according to South Korean law, lie detector results can only be used as reference and not as evidence. Moreover, individuals can undergo training to deceive lie detectors. However, in this case, the South Korean prosecutor's office chose to trust the lie detector results. Secondly, the autopsy report revealed that the victim's neck wound was inserted diagonally from behind. Therefore, 
The killer was determined to be taller and stronger than the victim. Cho Jung Pil, the victim, was 176 centimeters tall, Patterson was 173 centimeters tall, and weighed 75 kilograms. Li was 180 centimeters tall and weighed 105 kilograms. Consequently, the South Korean prosecutor's office firmly believed that Lee was the real murderer. So, in May 1997, the South Korean prosecutor's office formally charged Lee with murder. In the first trial, Lee was convicted, but he refused to plead guilty and appealed. By January of the following year, the Seoul District Court made a second trial verdict, still affirming Lee's conviction for murder and sentencing him to 20 years in prison. Patterson was convicted of concealing and destroying evidence, and sentenced to 18 months in prison. However, no one anticipated the unbelievable turn of events just seven months later, on August 15th. This day marks South Korea's Liberation Day, commemorating the country's independence from Japanese colonial rule. On this Liberation Day, the South Korean government granted amnesty to a group of prisoners, including Patterson. In other words, Patterson, sentenced to 18 months, was released after serving only a few months due to the amnesty. After Patterson's amnesty, South Korean public opinion erupted. Although the court had convicted Lee of murder, deeming him the killer, the grounds for the conviction were weak and unconvincing. For instance, the court believed Lee's tall stature and strength gave him the ability to diagonally stab the victim's neck from top to bottom. However, voices of doubt argued that although Patterson was three centimeters shorter than the deceased Cho Jung Pil, when someone is urinating, they are not standing straight, their feet would be apart, and their back would be bent. In this case, when Cho Jung Pil was urinating, his height would be shorter than his actual height by several centimeters, making it entirely possible for Patterson to carry out the same violent act. Meanwhile, Lee consistently denied the charges, insisting that Patterson was the killer, and he was wrongly accused, continuously seeking an appeal. Therefore, Patterson, who was granted amnesty, could very well be the real culprit. How could he be released so easily? Under public pressure, South Korean prosecutors applied for a temporary restraining order preventing Patterson from leaving the country, intending to prosecute him again for murder when the time was right. At that time, Patterson's exit restriction order was valid for three months, requiring the prosecution to reapply every three months to prevent his departure. However, on August 23, 1999, the expiration date of Patterson's most recent exit restriction order, for some reason, South Korean prosecutors forgot to reapply for the restriction order. Due to this oversight, the next effective date for the exit restriction order was on August 25th, creating a two-day gap. Patterson seemed to have known about this in advance, taking advantage of the two-day gap and successfully leaving South Korea on August 24th returning to the United States. To everyone's surprise, in the second month after Patterson fled back to the U.S., in September 1999, Lee, who had been convicted of murder in South Korea and continuously appealed, received a final verdict from the South Korean court. Due to insufficient evidence from the prosecution, Lee was rejudged as innocent and released. Now, just over two years later, the aftermath of the incident continues to unfold. One suspect has fled to the United States, while the other has been declared innocent after a prolonged legal battle. The incompetence and neglect of South Korean law enforcement and prosecutors have inflicted immense suffering on Cho Jung Pil's family, leaving the entire nation outraged but seemingly powerless. Fast forward to September 10, 2009, marking a staggering 12 years since the tragedy. On this day, South Korea premiered a film inspired by the case titled Murder in 81, featuring renowned actors such as Jang Kun Suk and Song Joong Ki. The movie reignited public discourse, shedding light on the perplexing events of 12 years prior. The public outcry against the perceived ineptitude and irresponsibility of South Korean authorities prompted action. In November 2009, just two months after the film's release, the South Korean police formally requested Patterson's extradition from U.S. authorities. The legal landscape is crucial here with South Korea's criminal prosecution period capped at 15 years. With 12 years having passed, a mere three years remained until the expiration of this critical deadline. Beyond this time frame, according to South Korean law, Patterson, even if back in the country, would be immune from prosecution. 
A stroke of luck occurred in June 2011 when Patterson was apprehended in the U.S. for another offense. With only six months left until South Korea's 15-year prosecution window closed, a pivotal witness emerged, someone familiar with both Lee and Patterson. This individual claimed to have encountered Patterson in a Los Angeles bar in 2007, where Patterson, with an air of arrogance, declared, I killed Cho Jung Pil, and the Koreans can't touch me. In December 2011, the U.S. Los Angeles court, acknowledging the abundance of evidence, decided to extradite Patterson to South Korea. At this juncture, South Korean law allowed the temporary suspension of the 15-year prosecution clock until Patterson's successful return, offering room for continued calculation. Simultaneously, Patterson vehemently maintained his innocence in the U.S. Finally, on September 23, 2015, Patterson was extradited to South Korea. Confronted by a throng of waiting media at the airport, Patterson continued to assert his innocence, shifting blame onto Lee. On January 25, 2017, the South Korean court publicly tried Patterson, handing down a 20-year prison sentence. Given Patterson's age at the time of the crime, this was the maximum penalty for juvenile offenders under South Korean law. In March 2017, the victim's family pursued the prosecutor's negligence, resulting in a settlement of 360 million Korean won. Meanwhile, the other initial suspect, Lee, now leads a settled life in South Korea, having embraced family life. The entire saga, spanning over 20 years, has finally reached a conclusion. However, Patterson, despite his conviction and incarceration, adamantly denies any wrongdoing. With Lee's acquittal in the final judgment, South Korean authorities cannot and will not reopen an investigation against him. Now, a lingering question emerges. What if Lee was the actual perpetrator? The story concludes here. How do you perceive the Itaewon murder case in South Korea? Whom do you believe is the real culprit? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments below. As always, take good care of yourselves. Love you all, and see you in the next episode.